let us. Uh, so last time we, we uh, ran out of time, so we just did a really quick uh, sort of 10 minute intro to Antarctica. So this time I want to um, go a little bit more in depth and, uh, and talk about the first example of um, a treaty that we're going to talk about in our uh, class. So this is a bit of review, but again, Antarctica, this the seventh continent, uh, unlike the North Pole, which is just surface water frozen, Antarctica, recall, actually has a landmass there. We mentioned that the winds just sort of go whipping around here and create the so-called Roaring Forties, the, the area with the only, the only place on the Earth where, where winds going um, parallel to the equator are unbroken by any landmass. So the winds can just spin and spin and spin in the, in the, the, the so-called fetch. How long the wind has to act upon the surface of the water is essentially, it could be infinite. Normally we talk about the fetch being a few miles, a few you know, dozens of kilometers, a few hundred kilometers, but this is essentially the wind, if the right condition goes on, you could just have these massive, massive, massive waves turn up just like if you had a, when you have your hair dryer in the bathtub and you're blowing on it with that consistent wind, it starts out little and then it could be bigger and bigger and bigger, those waves. Again, uh, this uh, leads to both atmospheric uh, circulation issues and surface water circulation issues. And in effect, um, during the right time of the year, and, and when we have these, uh, these winds and these currents cranking, we in effect have cut off Antarctica from uh, the rest of the uh, atmosphere. And indeed, that's at the heart of the problem with the ozone layer. Here, are, here is Antarctica with California for scale, so you have a sense of how big this place is. Noted in red. Oh, sorry, okay, yeah, so just by orientation, we didn't talk about this last time. This is East Antarctica, this is West, and then this is the peninsula. So those are the three main, uh, yeah, question. What were those two issues that you mentioned? Sorry, which two issues? The two issues of the, um, the wind. Oh, okay, sorry. So, um, yeah, I was going a little fast, but, uh, I apologize. So the idea here is that um, we have the air is, is blowing around, blow, almost like a, you can think of it like, the, like an eye of a hurricane, right? So if we're in the middle of the hurricane, we, it could be bright, sunny, you know, nice day, all this and that, because the air mass inside the eye is, is in effect a different chunk of the atmosphere from the stuff, say, out here in the big stormy, windy, rainy type of condition. And that's because the... the molecules of air or in the shallow ocean the molecules of water are essentially moving in unison with each other and in effect creating a wall between these different air masses and so we have uh, a air mass over Antarctica and then an air mass outside of Antarctica in the shallow surface water we have the waters of you know, proximate to the Antarctic Peninsula. And then we have the rest of the global ocean surface waters that they might go parallel to each other, but they're not, generally speaking, going to mix. We're not going to, this water molecule is going to go this way and kind of cruise around here. It's not going to, it's not going to cross this barrier. So when I, so the classic example of that, as I mentioned a second ago, is, is the Antarctic ozone so-called hole. It's really just a thinning of the ozone layer. Anybody remember the story of that? So the story with that, is, so, so it, it's, it's characterized as a hole because when you graph it out, the, the relative thickness of the ozone um, appears to be thin, although it, it's gaseous molecules, so they don't, they don't really get thin per se. They just get less dense. Um, Okay, so what's going on is we have these things called, so just like DDT, same exact story. Early on in, in the Industrial Revolution, early on in the post-World War II era, era, we're looking at chemical contaminants in these things. And the idea is, hey, let's see if we can find some, some chemicals that do exactly what we want. So in the case of the Antarctic uh, ozone hole, 
those are chlorofluorocarbons. So those are these substances that are incredibly inert, which is good. That's what you and I want, right? We don't want, we don't want things interacting and burning us or, or, or causing chemical reactions in our bellies or something like that, right? We want inert. That sounds good. And indeed, the inertness, the stability of these compounds led to their being used in a whole variety of things. Most prominently, fire retardants. Most prominently, aerosols. So when you guys put on deodorant, you like ax it up or whatever you kids do, right? You pump or you use a stick. But say in the 70s, it was all about the spray, right? 50s, 60s, that's right. Yeah, it's really good for fires. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, when women had their hair piled up, they were, they were spraying cans, right? right? And by spraying, I don't mean, I don't mean depress the nozzle and, and the physical strength of you pushing that leading to a pump and a sucking out. I mean compress gas inside a metal can and when we depress the top, that allows that gas to vent out, bringing along whatever it is with, with you. Hair, hair, what the hell is that? I don't know. I have no hair, so I don't know. Hairspray, thank you. Hairspray, <laughs> something I never use, hairspray. Or, or, you know, deodorant or whatever it is, right? So that's great. So we get a psh, and then I guess you don't have to work out your index finger because it's so hard to use a pump, I guess. And so that would be, oh, that's super nice. Uh, I, I, I forget something. So it was, it was uh, fire retardants. It was um, aerosols. Uh, oh, refrigerants. Refrigerants. So the stuff in your air conditioner in your car. The stuff in the refrigerator in your house. Those things. These compounds that um, are really good at conducting heat, etc. And again, they're, they're neutral. So if we, if we accidentally cut open our refrigerator, we're not going to have something that's flammable that could potentially cause a problem in our house. And then the third major use of chlorofluorocarbons uh, was as industrial solvents, so to clean things in factories and stuff. So again, nobody, so people actively chose these because they thought they would be better for the environment, safer for people, safer for the environment. Turns out in the case of, of these substances, they were so stable, nothing broke them down. So not typical uh, microbial action or, or, or typical sunlight or what have you. So they became ubiquitous. They came, became distributed throughout the atmosphere and everything. When they get up to the super, super high reaches of our upper atmosphere, at, towards the top of the ozone layer, and ozone is just uh, oxygen, right, in different form. And this oxygen gets hit by the radiation from space and it, it, it breaks down into oxygen and uh, carbon monoxide or, or, or CO2 or CO, or it depends on what's going on. But basically, um, that, that energy that turns that ozone molecule into oxygen and whatever the daughter products are, that saves you from getting cancer because all that high energy is absorbed into that chemical bond and it's great. On its own, just like we were talking about the uh, steady state hypothesis for salts in the ocean, right? Similar thing with the atmosphere. The ozone is, is essentially, in a, in a, historically, has been in a, in a steady state, right? We're producing about as much of it as we destroy. But what happens in this time of, um, of the ozone hole is these chlorofluorocarbons get up. And now these chlorofluorocarbons have gotten very high in the atmosphere, so high they're being exposed to this radiation, right, from the sun. But now, now that, that, that's the thing that can break them down. So now this high energy sun radiation is hitting those molecules, snapping them apart. This leads to um, some chemists from UC Irvine getting the Nobel Prize in chemistry for discovering this, how this worked. But basically the, 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 the the high energy of the radiation breaks those bonds. So no longer are the chlorofluorocarbons stable. Now they're chlorine up there, highly, highly reactive. So this chlorine scavenges the, the oxygen, and now it's essentially robbing our upper atmosphere of that, that, that oxygen structure that is absorbing the energy. So, so then what's happening is radiation is getting through at a much greater rate. And the reason, this is a long, this is a long answer to your question, sorry. See, you ask a professor a question, he talks forever. <laughs> but 
But what happens is, so this is the key to the ozone hole, this right here. Because, uh, and, and so we don't, have, we don't have a North American ozone hole, not really. We don't have a South American ozone hole. We don't have an Asian ozone hole. We have an Antarctic ozone hole because this is the spot in the globe where the air is cut off. So during, during austral summer, meaning the sunny, the, the southern summer warm time of year, we do not have an ozone hole. We only have a pronounced ozone hole in the Antarctic winter. And so what's going on there is when we have these big, huge, crazy, uh, uh, the atmosphere is being cut off, essentially all of the ozone is being depleted here and we're not getting rescued from the rest of the planet. That air isn't swooping in and refreshing the amount of ozone. So the ozone is allowed to get incredibly depleted. And, um, and so what really, and then we also came to realize that the surface of these ice clouds is a fantastic reactive surface for these chlorofluorocarbons. And we, had, we have clouds here in the winter. So the ozone hole goes crazy right when the first rays of sunlight of start, you know, the, the beginning, earliest, earliest time of the spring starts hitting these areas. They go crazy and there's a, a, essentially a buildup of this toxic chlorofluorocarbon concentration and it just scavenges all the ozone. The ozone drops to very low levels over the course of a few days or a few weeks. So that's the genesis of the ozone hole. What are all the penguins there? Oh, excellent question. We'll talk about penguins shortly. But uh, no, penguins don't get cancer. Although, although there was worry of that. Um, I, I, wasn't, I, I wasn't really going to go into I probably should have talked about I should probably put some more slides in about the, the ozone hole. We can talk about it later. It is a fantastic example you guys should all know about because of the so-called Montreal Accord, the Montreal Protocol. Check it out. This is not science fiction. Everybody looking at me? All these countries got together from around the world and a bunch of people said, we can't do this because these things are really important and we make money off them. So the adults got together from around the world and they said, this is a serious problem. We need to solve this. So we all agreed to, over the course of many years, phase out these different compounds in different industrial uses and in aerosol sprays, etc. And, oh my God, the economy didn't crush to nothing. Oh my God, people weren't dislocated. Oh my God, corporations did not fail. The adults got together and they proposed reasonable responses to this global threat. This was one of the, the, the first big, we're going to talk about the Antarctic Treaty in a second, but, but this ozone hole, in terms of clear environmental issues, this is one of the first times when it was very clear we could not solve it. This is a global scale thing. If we changed our practices in the US, that wouldn't do it. If Russia changed its practices, that wouldn't do it. If Japan, we all had to do this, or at least the vast majority of us had to do this, or it wasn't going to work. And surprise, surprise, adults can sit down when they behave like adults and actually acknowledge facts, acknowledge reality, and solve problems. So, that, so the ozone hole is a great success. Just like maybe some other situation we're dealing with right now, simply making the change doesn't instantly solve the problem, doesn't resolve the coastal marine management challenge. There's so much inertia in the system, the ozone hole continued to get worse for a while. But we've basically plateaued out. And now we're starting the arc of recovering and the ozone hole is starting to be less and less thin each year. It's going to take a while. It's going to take no another many decades slash hundred years or so, but we're clearly on the right track with that, with that particular challenge. Anybody, somebody had a question about that? So that's Antarctic ozone hole caused by this weather phenomenon, this, this circular wind and well in the case of, of, can you, of yeah. Can you explain the wind again? Okay, so the Is wind again, let me show you this picture. Is so this is the wind, right? So if the wind is coming here, let's imagine, so, okay, so here's the South Pole. So imagine the Earth is spinning, right? We're spinning on our axis. So if we're a little bit of wind, if we're some air molecules, if we're wind and we're blowing, we're 
blowing, blowing, right. blowing, 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 blowing. What? Now we fit a, a land mass, and so even if it's ice, it, it, the temperature is going to be different. It's going to be different than the water. Um, if there's any kind of elevation, as there are mountains here, now we're going to be deflected up. Essentially, it's causing roughness. It's called, causing breakage in our even flow, right? It's screwing us up. It's slowing us down. It's causing turbulence. So therefore, a mountain chain, a building, um, a canyon wall, whatever it is, is going to act to get in the way of that wind. And it won't stop the wind entirely, but it's going to start to knock it down. Same thing if we're up here around Tierra del Fuego or Chile or whatever, right? We're, we're, let's say we start here. Uh, let, let, let's, let's look at this picture. Let, let's say we start here. Okay, dude, we're blue going around the pole. Oh, just dodged Africa. Whoa, just dodged South America. Oh, wow, well, it's a bonk. Then we hit this dude, right? Everywhere on the surface of the earth, if we start out over water and we're going east or west, we're going to hit land. Now, if we start right, he if we start right here, it's gonna, we're going to go you know, a long ways around, around the, the planet before we hit land, but we're eventually going to hit land. The only spot right now on the Earth with the way our continents and tectonic plates are at the moment, the only place where you will not hit land is this area here between um, the tip of Tierra del Fuego and the uh, southern tip of South America and the northern tip of the Antarctic Peninsula. So in those cases, when the conditions are right and the wind starts blowing, and again, we have this Coriolis effect, right? This deflection of, of wind. And, and we get those, remember, we got those banding patterns when we talked about uh, trade winds and all that kind of stuff, right? We get these, these defined areas where the wind tends to go hor uh, a parallel to the equator. You guys remember that? Yeah. So that's going on. And so here, when that happens, when the wind is blowing this way, there's nothing to break it up. So the seas get huge. So the, the air is just spinning, spinning, spinning. It's like a fidget spinner. If, if, and never mind, I don't like the one I'm talking about fidget spinners. But, but, but anyway, but the, but the point is, it, right? It just goes spinning, 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 spinning. So n there is no such thing as a perpetual motion machine, but there's a lot of missing friction here that, that you would get if you hit South America or if you hit the Antarctic Peninsula. Does that make sense? So it's always a clockwise. If you're looking at the South Pole, it's always a clockwise. Well, uh, in the in the air, yeah. generally speaking, yes, you can get you can get polar and circumpolar currents, just like you get California currents and the California counter current. But but in the air, it's generally going this away. And then I showed you those maps from those weather maps from the ship I was on, right? So here you can just see that with clouds. Check it out. Here, this cloud, the wind is so blowing, this cloud is not really. Is not right. You can see the color. This is all dark, dark. Here we have all this cloudy area. Here's another example of, of turbulence being caused. But check it out. We still have, you know, essentially these eddies and stuff going on up here and down here. Different color, um, different uh, color air corresponding to clouds or lack of clouds. And then that translates into these really huge seas. These giant, these giant waves and these huge swells that make everybody get sick when they travel on the boat. Cool? Does that make sense? <coughs> okay. And we talked about last time that we, I told you guys a story about the, the freighter breaking up and there wasn't much that we could do about it. Sea ice. That's what we're looking at right here. Sea ice. What's going to happen What's going to happen each year is this ice. So this is this is the ice that's on top of this part is a glacier, right? That's frozen water. That that's not disappearing, refreezing every year. That's just, that's just old frozen water molecules. But out at sea, when it gets that really cold time of year, the the austral winter, it's going to be very dark. Very cold. The air is going to be very cold. And so the very surface of the ocean is going to freeze. And so at the warmest time of year, the ice is going to be relatively close into the continent. In the coldest time of the year, that ice is going to expand and reach far away from the continent. Yeah? Good? So what this is showing you, 
what this is showing you is this is this is satellite data and it's looking at the amount of ice coverage and this particular one is looking at uh, the change over uh, several years this is looking at the change over about uh, about 30 years from 79 to I think this data set is 2000, like 2009 or 2010 one or the other so if we look at this what's going on is is uh, yeah so so this 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 guy's this guy's changing so this area right here it's experiencing several days less uh, uh, ice on average here's a graphical version of that so there's always noise in the system right always noise but over time we're seeing a clear trend this is called science people so when you talk to some people that are not scientists and don't utilize their brain they might look at this and go oh you say it's like not happening it's happening but then look right here it was here and then it went up you're liars <laughs> no we're talking about long-term changes right so the long-term trend which is symbolized by this best fit line and and so we see a dramatically um, reduced amount of surface sea ice over time. And what's that? What that's caused? That's caused this, amongst other things. Here are three different species of penguins. There's a delis on the left. There are chin straps in the middle, and you can tell because it looks like they're wearing a little bit of a, of a sort of helmet on their, on their uh, chin. And then um, there's gentoos on the right. And while you see the gentoos seem to be doing better over time, most of these guys are uh, either not doing great or they are declining. Hold on to that thought for a second. Let's, let's step back and talk a little bit about the ecosystem of uh, Antarctica, the general ecosystem. It's a very interesting place, very, very productive, but also uh, a lot of crazy stuff, but from a trophic level, r somewhat simplified. Scientists like simplified systems. Do we want to have 14 million variables or four? Well, let's pick four, and it's easier for us to get our simple human brains wrapped around them. So these food webs have been very attractive to researchers for a long time. And so key players here are going to be a lot of microbial, phytoplankton -y, that kind of stuff, right? Single-celled kind of uh, guys doing their do. There's going to be a, a large amount of critters hanging out in the bottom. Very uh, interesting critters down there. Then there's going to be this huge abundance of krill, these sh shrimp, euphousid shrimp, a type, of, a type of shrimp, that are super abundant. More on them in a bit. But everything eats the krill. The whales eat the krill. The seabirds eat the krill. The fish eat eat the krill. The uh, crab eater seals eat the krill. The penguins eat the krill. So it's a, it's a, it's a really um, tractable system for ecologists to get their head around. So here's uh, some examples of the research station where I worked. So this is uh, the Antarctic so-called Palmer Station. Um, this is the this is the, the the huge station. Look at that! Oh my God, it's so massive. There's a few buildings there. Um, this is uh, one of the supply supply areas. This is what the bay looks like that you come into. In this case, the ice was sort of just thinning this day, and this is what it looks like at uh, when the sun is fully up. When when you're getting at the time of year when the sun when the sun is is getting more northward. Really cool place. One of the most interesting aspects from our coastal and marine management perspective about Antarctica is, of course, the ice. 
The ice is really trippy. So this is a picture of these guys taking some ice cores and the camera is, is partly underwater, partly in the air. And um, what you see is on the surface, you see this relatively flat structure. But because the ice is constantly freezing and then it's not quite frozen yet and the wind blows a little bit and it bangs into this piece and whatever, we get this so-called rafting or over rafting of the ice. So what you see down here is this was a piece of frozen uh, sea ice that got bumped up against this guy and then this piece went over it. And then it, it got cold again so it froze. Same thing here, this part was, was over here and then the wind blew and it kind of buckled and it tumbled and then it ended up here. So, so the top is generally pretty smooth on average. This is sea ice we're talking about. The stuff in the bottom is incredibly diverse. All kinds of nooks and crannies for things like krill to hang out in. So if they can hang out there, if they have some refuge, then they can hide and they can become abundant. And so that really uh, helps drive this ecosystem. You guys were asking about penguins. There's tons of penguins. You guys all think penguins are super cute. It's probably because you've never been to a penguin colony. <laughs> penguin colonies smell really, really bad. Because when the sun is up in the austral summer, it's up all the time. And these guys, and so these are little chicks. These are chi here's an adult, here's some chicks. And they just, the chicks just sit there and they poop on themselves and on the dirt and on the this and on the that. So these colonies are really, really abundant. Now, you're used to seeing all the cool Hollywood pictures and it's all, oh, it's so nice and pristine and snowy. When these guys are doing their do, it's the warmer time of the year. So a lot of times that snow is melted, so they're on dirt. So it's not even poop snow, it's poop mud. And it is, and so look at these guys. They're not pretty and pristine, they're covered in poop mud, man. And uh, yeah, and they're, uh, 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 it's very loud and it smells like poop mud. Um, this is the kind of pretty picture people think they're gonna see. Um, uh, in these systems, because they're so simplified, you can use a lot of, uh, uh, much more so than in some of our other areas of the world, like say California, you can use critters to do the science for you at times. So these are some of my uh, colleagues and we just caught some penguins. If you want me to tell you how you catch penguins, I'll tell you when we take a break. But basically we caught these penguins and penguins are all muscle. So it's all breast meat, right? So all they do all day long is, is, is pull their wings down and flap and swim. So they're really, really strong. So if you get a, an adult, um, like an emperor penguin, an adult emperor penguin, it can break your leg, no problem. Boom, snap your leg in half right now. So they're, they're flippers, they have these big strong bones in their flippers and they swim through the water. And you know, an emperor penguin is all bone and he's tall. So you hit these little guys in your hands and you're thinking, oh, like what? I can take the little penguin, dude. And they're very strong. And it takes two hands to hold onto them. And they will get out of your hands really quickly. So I don't have any macho uh, lion scars but I have penguin scars, very manly, very manly. Cause, so you'll see these guys have gloves on. These guys have gloves on. And so here is before we do our sampling. Here's after this one in my lap. Why is he in my lap? Because I just pumped his stomach out. And so when he's like this, he's like, let me go, you bastard. So we caught these guys. And these guys eat a phenomenal amount of krill. Okay, so these, these guys uh, are, are, these are deli penguins. They're eating krill all the time. Their mouths, if you open their mouth, if you look inside their beak, you'll see these backward pointing sort of like teeth. So the idea is they don't have fingers, right? If they're going to eat something, they're going to put their mouth around it and, uh, and, then uh, and swallow the thing whole, right? So they just eat all day long. Eat, 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 eat. So if we have an abundant population of krill, ha, huh, we should have penguins with really full bellies, right? So we catch these guys and, uh, and bring them up to the, the ship and they're like, no, 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 no. And then we take a, a paint, a, a hand pump, like to do spray painting, like a, a, a little hand crank pump that you would move paint from one bucket to another. Uh, you get a Home Depot for like 10 bucks and you get a Home Depot bucket, you get a five gallon bucket and you grab seawater. And you take the seawater and you put it in the microwave, warm it up so it's not cold, warm it up. And then you take, and, and so these guys don't have 
uh, crops. Some birds have crops, these little like chunks of stone where they, where they have, are muscularized and they can squeeze and they, they essentially can chew, if you will, inside their, inside their throats. Turkeys have that. Um, these guys don't have that. So we can just take this tube and put the tube right down their throat and into their stomach. And so you pump in this warm seawater and you can imagine, uh, it doesn't feel good. You can imagine if you had a bunch of warm seawater in and then you listen and the penguin's like, let me go, bastard, let me go, bastard. And all of a sudden you hear, gargle, gargle, and like, oh, damn. And then you have another bucket and you yank out the tube and you invert the penguin, and the penguin gets sick in the bucket. Oh, 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 oh. Right? <laughs> and you have a bunch of krill, and you have a fantastic measurement of how abundant the krill are in the local area. So that sounds super cruel. It's, I, I know. It sounds, it sounds awful, but check it out. Totally chill now. <laughs> not, not biting me now. <laughs> bastard, right? Yeah, who's the bastard now? So actually, surprisingly, the studies all find this is the least impactful uh, uh, thing to do to birds. If a lot of times you catch a bird, draw a little bit of blood for genetic work, put a, put a ring around their leg or whatever, turns out this is one of the least impactful things. Within, within a few 10, 15 minutes of, of us doing this and letting them go, here's, here's just letting them go off the back of the deck, they're back to behaving totally normally. You can't see any difference in their behavior. They're eating like normal, etc. So this is not lethal to these guys. I'm sure they don't like it. I mean, I wouldn't. It's like some alien doing a probe on you or something. But but afterwards, they're to, they're they're cool. This doesn't this doesn't cause permanent damage. Um, they're back to eating, all that kind of stuff. So by looking at yeah, oh sorry, I thought that was a question. So uh, again, by looking at some of these populations, we um, have seen some reason for concern. We were doing a lot of whaling back in the day in Antarctica. More on that in another lecture. We were doing a lot of sealing, taking seals in Antarctica back in the day. Um, when we talk about that, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll, we'll talk about the uh, whale harvest and stuff in the future, but suffice it to say, we don't, except for a few bizarro countries like Norway and Japan, we don't take whales, and even those guys, we don't take whales at the rate that we were taking whales. So hey, great, man, we're gonna see whales come back. The whales haven't really come back the way we thought they would. And some things, like Adelis, are declining. So something seems to be amiss with the Antarctic ecosystem. The Antarctic ecosystem is, is very interesting. That, that's my only blurry picture, because it was so cold I couldn't focus the camera. That is one of four native grass species that exist in Antarctica. So the terrestrial side of the equation is pretty boring, unless you're a microbial biologist. There, there, it's so cold, there's not a lot of, uh, of angiosperms or anything like that, right? So that, that's sort of it. And of some lichens. I mean, if you like lichens, I don't, I don't want to crap on lichens, but you know, it's not, no palm trees, as it were. Most of the interesting action is below the surface in Antarctica. So for example, this is the back of our boat, and it might be a little hard to see, but what these are called, these are called footprints, or fin prints, and this is a psi whale. He just broke the surface right there. And he's kicking, and every time he kicks with his fluke just underwater, it makes a, a sort of bubbling of the water bubbling of the water. So awesome. All kinds of, of things like whales are in this subtitle ecosystem. On land, um, we see all kinds of interesting stuff, even in the ice. So the stuff that looks pink, well, this is an old photograph, but it's supposed to be pink. Um, that stuff is, uh, is um, archaea are, are, are these microbes living in the ice, frozen but they're not, their body, their metabolism has gone very s slow, slowed down, but it hasn't stopped. So there's all kinds of interesting things just below the surface. There's also interesting things just on the surface. So this is a leopard seal. These guys are very aggressive predators. And uh, if you guys want it, sometime we take a break, whatever, I'll tell you the story about, uh, about my encounter with uh, seals underwater. Uh, 
But these guys are really aggressive. They have, they're one of the top predators in, in Antarctic systems. They feed on penguins and they have these really intense canine teeth. Very aggressive. One of my friends almost lost her kneecap to one. Um, popped up. One of these guys ate a Mark V Zodiac. I don't know if you guys know what a Mark V Zodiac is. Big inflatable and, and, and rigid hull inflatable boat. And, and that has pontoons. In each of the pontoons, they have separate cells. So if one pops, the whole thing doesn't sink. This guy popped all four cells and drug the whole boat down with, I don't know how many, $20,000 worth of engine parts and stuff like that. I mean, they, these guys are, are very uh, amazing animals. Here's one, this is an incredible series of photos where this guy is eating a, uh, a penguin, which is crazy that Phil's in the water taking these, uh, these pictures, but uh, crazy stuff. Uh, these are my pictures. Th this is uh, a leopard seal. This is a crab eater seal. Crab eater seals so named because the whalers, when they first saw them, when they would poop out on the, on the ice, it would look red. And so they thought it looked like crab. So they were right, it was a crustacean, but instead of pooping out crab remains, they were pooping out krill remains. So these big, you know, several, you know, maybe 1,200 pound animals are eating krill. All kinds of wonderful diversity underneath the ice. So this is a jellyfish. And then these are some uh, parasitic copepods that are eating it, that are in turn eating it. Nice. Really crazy cool shapes and things like that going on under the ice. All kinds of wonderful invertebrate, yeah. Do you, do, you, uh, do you find that in the Antarctic, there are they poisonous? Like a Portuguese man of war? No, no, not like you're thinking. No, no. This, anybody know what this is? Yeah, that's right. It's a salp. So this is a, a, a like, like a tunicate. So this is a urochordate. So when this guy is in larval form, he actually has a primitive uh, type of notochord. And then once he metamorphoses into an adult, loses that, that uh, 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 primitive nervous uh, system uh, part of his uh, anatomy. So this guy is basically like a barrel. So water's gonna come in, he's gonna, and, and all his guts and stuff are in here, but all kinds of really cool so-called gelatinous zooplankton. So what does plankton mean again? Moving around. Moving around. Can't go the right. So most of its movements are dictated by currents, right? And so zooplankton means it's an, it's an animal version or a heterotroph of phytoplankton is gonna be one of those guys that photosynthesizes, that has chlorophyll and stuff like that. Cool? So gelatinous zooplankton, gelatinous just mean like they're like jello, usually clear. Jellyfish are an example of that. These kind of salps are examples of this. So this guy is relatively small, but I would see them sometimes they'd be about this long and they would form a corkscrew where there are col colonies. So they, one, guy, one guy would be like this and then this dude's butt was sort of attached to this dude's head and then on and on and on making a big corkscrew like a meter in diameter going off for maybe you know, hundreds of meters out in any one direction. Crazy cool animals, crazy cool animals. Um, a lot of interesting adaptations for more of the common animals that you and I would experience. So this is an ice fish. So a lot of these guys have the, these, these fish, for example, live in these relatively cold waters, have sort of what amounts to antifreeze for blood. So they don't get ice crystals forming in their blood. It's pretty, pretty cool. These petrels and these, these birds um, are really, really good at adapting to food sources that come to the surface. So when a whale goes underneath and spooks the krill and the krill go up to the top of the water, these birds come in and, and have a feast. Just like there's interesting stuff on the skin of the, the water-air interface, there's all kinds of interesting stuff at the interface of the water-land. And so this, in this case, this is um, a field of, of starfish, sea stars underneath the ice in some shallow water areas. And this is um, when I, so I, I, one of my jobs, I had to do net toes and, and get krill in the water. And one time, um, 
uh, someone screwed up, it probably wasn't me. Um, but someone screwed up, it probably was me. And, and the net bounced on the bottom. Or actually, we, actually, I think there was a little C-mount that came up. And we didn't realize it. So this big net that we're towing behind that we're supposed to keep in the water column is bouncing off the bottom of the ocean. And so we brought it up. And instead of having krill inside, it had all these crazy cool um, crabs and, and um, uh, benthic critters, sea urchins, etc., in there. Uh, one example of how amazing this, this place is is this. So this is from that, those net toes I would do. The research crew was all built, the research crews was built around, uh, were built around, this was a multi-year project, decadal project, but getting the krill. There's all kinds of other cool stuff. Can you guys see that? You probably can't see much. There's all kinds of crazy cool things in this seawater. Here is but one example. So these are, um, anybody know what these guys are? It's a better shot. What's that? Uh, rotifers? Not rotifers. Tinafores. Mm -hmm. Tinafores, another cool type of gelatinous zooplankton. Tinafores spelled like this. You'll never get it right. But it's a great uh, Scrabble word. Tinafores starts with, of course, a C. C T E N O Tinofore. So teen comes from this so-called teen rows, which they have these little hair-like structures that are so fine, they refract light. So they act like a prism. So um, if you look at these guys, this guy has a little bit of a rainbow effect. These guys have rainbows on them, these guys have rainbows. That's because we're shining white light on them and these things act like a, a crystal, breaking it into all the colors of the rainbow. Really, really cool, really cool dudes. So all kinds of stuff like that. Then one day, I look down and I get uh, these things. So this is a ketignath. You guys probably know what that is. So called arrow worm or glass worm. These little, these very aggressive predators of fish larvae. What is it? It looks like a, looks yeah. like a thin sausage. Yeah, but it's voracious if you're a little larvae, right? And so this guy was super cool. He has a blue it looks like a little bit of color here. It's a bright blue plane going through the entirety of his body. It looked like someone took a glass slide and jammed it through it. Didn't understand how he could be alive. Looked through all the textbooks. Can't look at all the guidebooks. Can't figure out what it is. Talk to the, the head scientist. Have you guys ever seen anything like this? No. What? Super cool. I'm going I'm to name me an uh, animal. Right? Or I'll name it after my, what was it? I guess at this point it was my girlfriend then, not my wife. So I'll name it after her. Get a lot of points, right? That'd be great. <laughs> this guy is a polychaete, which it's b a bad image, but it's a ball of constantly flopping on top of itself. It doesn't look real. It looks like some kind of weird special effect. So these are just two guys from one of the toes. Awesome. So I finish up my, my 16 hour shift. I'm going to go and I'm, gonna, I'm a scientist. I'm not going to go sleep. I'm going to go describe these critters. But of course I need some soda. So I go down to the, go down to the, uh, to the kitchen, get some soda, pop some popcorn, because that's kind of what you did. Came back, where's my dudes? Where's the things new to science? And my friend, who's now the diving safety officer for UCLA and San Diego State, the crazy Italian dude, um, he says, uh, I said, dude, where's my, where's my stuff? I'm gonna be a famous scientist, dude. Said, what? And I said, where's my stuff? Where's the this? And he says, uh, I don't know. I didn't see anybody. I just saw some like extra stuff. Like, well, where'd you put the extra stuff? I threw it overboard. What? So I could have been famous, and then my friend threw it overboard. So, but that's Antarctica, right? I mean, incredibly raw, incredibly amazing diversity, but different from our the kind of diversity we're used to experiencing here off the California coast. Not only do they have great diversity, they have just like most of our coastal marine management area uh, issues. They have increasing threats from the human footprint. So in this case, this is a boat that, that sunk uh, there, uh, a private vessel, and increasing interest in, um, in how our impact, our pollution, our active extraction is, help, is impacting things like whales. These guys are, these are some orcas going through this channel and uh, all kinds of neat stuff going on. 
So let, let's look at one example of the importance of understanding all that, that physical oceanography stuff we mentioned that we touched on in our sort of survival oceanography 101. So this is the ship I used to be on, the Polar Duke. And we'd, we'd go around and we'd catch things. This is what a krill looks like up close. This is, again, a euphousid shrimp. Now, humans have been, so animals have been eating these shrimp for a while, but humans have actually been doing it for quite some time. Here's a picture of some folks fishing for krill in 1932 in Antarctica. So they're fishing for them by dragging nets. They're so abundant, you can drag a net through the water and get enough protein to, to, to eat. Turns out these krill are found all around uh, the Arctic, excuse me, all around the Antarctic, excuse me. And so this representation shows the frequency of their encounter when guys are towing nets. So over here, we put nets in the water, we either, did, either got nothing or got very little, right? Very little, very little. But there's some areas where we get a ton, right? Consistently get a lot of krill. So therefore, they're responding to some variance in the in the environment and they they seem to be digging it oh good question yeah so 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 clearly the current is helping isolate this body of water but these guys probably aren't responding to the current per se they're responding to this so this was none other than our that's well so this is none other than what we did last week or the other week with our with our melted ice so all we've done is we've taken some sea ice we've added some stuff called fluorescein dye that 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 glows sort of brightish yellow when it's exposed to seawater we froze that and you can see right here we've dropped this uh ice cube in the water into a tank of krill. The krill are swimming all around. Swimming all around, swimming all around, swimming all around. These dudes are like, damn dude, what's up? And then all of a sudden, what? He runs into that density stream. And so you guys know what that is. Why, why is this water mass sinking? Right, it's more dense because hypersaline, right? So, so water at the same temperature, if we have more salts in it it's more dense right so it's sinking so this is what happens these krill cruising around all of a sudden boop they bump into this into this uh this stream and so so we're just visualizing it with the fluorescein dye it's easier to see it's like we used it's like we use fish uh food coloring and then this guy's like wait and he turns and he runs straight up he tracks he tracks that stuff then he goes right up to underneath the ice you think he's smelling salt? Maybe he's going to light. He's not going to light, but good guess. He's not, sm he's not going to the salt. Not going to the dye, something else. Yes. Yes. So in the water column, normally there's a bunch of phytoplankton. Right? We freeze the surface of the ocean and everything freezes. Remember we have those brine pockets? In those brine pockets go all the stuff that's not pure water. And so that's the salt, but guess what? That's also these little, these little this phytoplankton, right? So when this guy melts, not only is it hypersaline, it's super rich and goopy, goopy, good stuff to eat for these guys. So he's not responding to this seems saltier or denser. He's like, damn, that tastes good. So he runs straight up hits the bottom, starts ripping off these chunks that are just sort of starting to fall out of the, out of the ice cube. And then look, this dude ripped a piece off and he's cruising around, he's like, damn, I got my lunch, right? So that little example that, that's illustrated here with this little tank thing we did is going on all the time, all throughout Antarctica when, we're, when the sea ice is melting. So the sea ice is this huge flush of productivity, this huge flush of chlorophyll, this huge flush of, of salad, if you will. And then these krill are responding and they're gonna start getting huge. They're gonna start growing bigger and fatter and then they're gonna be great food sources for the, for the whales and for the everybody. Um, 
so all kinds of stuff are done down there. This is called a biological, uh, a biologically optical or biophysical optical profiling system. Um, and we won't spend much time on this, but this is this is called a rosette, right here. This is a, a big cable. We lower it out. Here you see it being lowered over the back of the boat. This goes down, and this has sensors. We can measure the temperature and this and that. But also, it's got all these bottles. This has a valve on this end. This has a valve on this end. You can see them opened up. So when we lower it down into the water column, the water shoots right through here. Like it's like a big straw. So we lower down this through the water column. We go through different clines. You guys know what those are, right? Thermoclines, pycnoclines, all those things. And we're like, ooh, that's really interesting. It's a different water mass. So you lower this guy down, maybe a kilometer straight down into the ocean. Then you turn around and you pull it up. And as you're pulling it up, you're like, damn, dude, at 1,000 a a thousand meters, it's really interesting. And so you, you remotely trigger one of these things and the, and the flop and, and the valve close on the top and close on the bottom, so you now have an isolated piece of that water. So you can bring it up and you can look at how much carbon dioxide is in that water, how many, how many nutrients are in that water, and, and look at the, the, the chemical properties of the water. Super cool. Not fun, I'm, I'm not that interested, so I was doing stuff with animals, but if you're interested in chemistry, super cool, right? You got all this great stuff. Um, and then this is how we do net toes. You, you drag things. This is me when I had hair. Dumping things over the side and, and bringing stuff up in them. Um, this is th that guy that threw my stuff away. This is what it looks like. <laughs> real quickly, this is what it looks like. Um, uh, what's our time looking like? This is what it looks like uh, when you go diving down there. So we, we do what's called um, dry suit diving. And so this is long underwear. And then, so you layer long underwear, and then you wear these sort of like spacesuit kind of thermal underwear things, and then you put on these dry suits, and then uh, you go out, and, and we would go onto the ice through, um, uh, through Zodiac, so we take the, the engine off, and we'd be lowered down, and so these guys are getting ready to go dive, these guys are tending them, and these are little tools we use to, to measure how much chlorophyll is in the water. It's very awkward, so it's hard to move, so you have to have people help help do stuff for you. And um, that's me. Uh, I always would take pictures, so I have very few pictures of me, but that's me looking super elegant, about to get in the water. And this is what it looks like when the, so the boat would leave us, and we'd dive in the hole the boat created in the ice. And then it would go away for a while, then it would come back, get back in the boat. Again, um, ice, very productive. So when you, look, when you look underwater, it's not simple, it's very complex. So right there, check it out. Right there, we have some purple. We have some blue. There's some brown over here, some green. Each of those is a different species or different density of algae. So this ice is rich, rich, rich with this primary productivity. And then sometimes it's really snowy and it's hard to see the boat sometimes. Um, very dynamic uh, ice conditions. So this is uh, cutting through some of these um, like broken glass type of ice. Okay, so you guys should understand a little bit of this in the era of climate change. So here's some different examples of ice. This is sea ice. This is surface ice that froze. This is glacial ice. This is ice that was on land that fell into the water. How can I tell? You can tell because there's dirt in there. You guys see the strips? See this? This is from rubbing against rocks, rubbing against um, the bottom of the earth, uh, the, the uh, sediment. Um, all kinds of crazy things are increasingly being cast off from Antarctica. As, the, as Antarctica melts, we're, we're breaking off long, vast, you know, huge icebergs that back in the day we would have never thought we would have seen. This is, this is a very small iceberg, but um, a huge range of ice So sea ice, so-called pancake ice, and um, a, a broken free glacier. And I just have some random pictures of the station and trans trans transition around. Okay, so challenge. Yeah. What forms a clear ice? Some of the ice clear ice. Yes, yeah, so clear is cause right, exactly. So clear means no, no air. Okay, so this one, uh, do I have a better picture? 
Okay, this one. It's a little hard to tell, but if we get closer, this looks blue. So this is really clear. So this is what the, uh, the alcoholics call bar ice. This is what they would always want to use for bar ice. Because right, we saw when we took our ice cube that we made ourselves by freezing the water at regular 32 degrees Fahrenheit in our, in our refrigerator, there's all kinds of gas in there, right? So we freeze it, and so we have these ice cubes that work great for a little soda, but if we're really trying to get stuff really cold, it's not going to stay cold for very long, right? It's going to melt. So the preferred ice is this stuff, which is glacial ice. And so, so that formed, and then we have all this weight essentially squeezing down on us. And so one, one it, it, it's, it's, it's not created super quick like the ocean uh, water that has all this gas dissolved in it. But then two, it essentially, some of this gas can be squeezed out under you know, the bottom of this stuff. So you get this stuff that's much more clear, like you're saying. It, if you hold it up, it's like looking through a, a crystal as opposed to looking through a frosted pane, which is what our regular ice cubes are like. And so therefore, it takes a long time to melt because it's only going to melt from the outside in. Whereas our ice cubes are melting from the outside in, and every one of those little air bubbles is a weak spot that is helping to break it up. Does that answer your question? Okay. Okay, so here we go. So the the evidence that that uh, that's, that uh, interesting stuff happens in Antarctica. This is a satellite image on the cover of a peer-reviewed journal called Science, and then this is the time lapse. So this is using satellites to sense the conditions of the shallow ocean. So this is a common measurement. This is looking at chlorophyll A. So this is looking at the most common form of light harvesting pigment. And so in this case, this is false color, as you can see from the scale here. Hot means more. Cool means uh, less. And so uh, we see these incredible explosions. Check it out. So the ice is melted. Everywhere is lit up. Every, the water is full of chlorophyll. As we go through time, it sort of dis dissipates a little, kind of dies, and then kind of has a little bit of a second birth. Here we have a little a secondary bulb, 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 bulb. But what this is saying is all the action is not in the water column. It's right at the exact melting ice edge of that ice. So in other words, the, the, the dynamics of how ice melts is going to determine a lot in terms of what we get in terms of productivity. And we already know that the productivity is going to determine what we get in terms of krill. And now we know what we, we do in terms of krill is going to influence our whales and all that kind of stuff. So now we have a hypothesis about whales. Anybody want to take a stab at that hypothesis about why the whale populations haven't recovered as quickly as we thought they might? Something to do with the melting point or the food source point. I don't know. Yeah, good. Somebody help her? Um, are whales migratory? Uh, whales are migratory. Uh, mo oh, well. Most are, yeah. Yeah, so, good, and? So, so give me a specific hypothesis for why whales haven't recovered. There's less ice. There's less ice, less food. But I thought you said there was food in the melted ice. There is. Well, there is. Much much. But, so absolutely, there, 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 there's, there's a gazillion tons of, of krill right now. But the krill isn't the same as it used to be. So even though there's still tons... Not as much as it used to be, not around maybe for as long as it was before, right? Sort of a shorter window, perhaps, right? That ice, that ice edge isn't hanging around for a whole lot longer. It's kind of disappearing quick. So for example, here is the, here's a measure of sea ice extent. In this case, this is Arctic, but it's, a, it, it's, it's the same idea. So here we go. Here's the different years, and this is over time. And what we're seeing is over time, we're seeing uh, less extent, less extent, less extent. So when we go out and measure krill, so these are our monitoring stations. So here's the peninsula. And here are these stations we go to every year to do, 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 go out and, and, and sample the krill in each of these spots. So we have a nice long data set. And it shows that the krill aren't as abundant as they used to be. Yeah. Uh, it's a different species, but 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 there, but there are there are phytoplankton and stuff up there too. Yeah. Okay, so kind of like the same. Because 
I not as intense, but not as intense. Yes, right. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so, so, so the Arctic is very productive as well. Okay. So, so yes, yeah, so bone That's right. So That's right. very productive, but not as productive as before. That's right. Okay. That's right. So something about the freezing of the, of the water allows it to, to keep all of that biomass. In so it. imagine this. Imagine this. L let's imagine we are a... What, what, what would a more familiar example for you guys be? Uh, let's imagine we are a... A crow, a crow that's going to feed them the garbage out in front of your house, right? So if back in the day, you put the garbage cans out and they kind of took a long time to come in and come out and they're out there, right? The crows can be feeding on the garbage for a week or two, right? And getting all fat and happy and getting really good. Versus if we left, if we took the garbage cans out, left them out for a day and then took them back, right? Of course there's going to be garbage. Of course the crow's going to feed on them but they're not going to feed for as long or, or get as much nutrients, right? So there's still going to be crows there, but they're not going to be the way they were back in the day, right? So turns out now when we start talking about overfishing, when we talk about fishing and stuff, we'll find that one of the things people do is when they deplete something, they switch to something else. Krill. Who likes, who's, who's had krill? Who's eaten krill? Oh, sounds like we need to have a snack. <laughs> the only people I know that love krill are the Norwegians. They like eat it like toothpaste too. They're like, me, 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 krill. It's like, <laughs> really dude? So, um, so uh, but increasingly, folks are going down to Antarctica not to get whales, not to get fish, to get krill. Super exciting. Mm, I love what you've done with your shrimp paste. <laughs> so that should be concerning to us. One, because that says maybe there aren't enough fish and people aren't eating the fish. But two, if we go after the, the, if we go after the, the base of the food chain and we take that out, everybody's going to be impacted, right? So we've gone from being stressed because of the dynamics of sea ice to now we're maybe being stressed because that, that item is being removed.